Is dark matter so strong that it can lift a starship? Probably not, but maybe. Hi, I'm Mike Siegel. I'm an astrophysicist. I write for Ordinary Times, and this is The Throughput. So it's been a little while. We're going to jump right back in. I did Star Wars a few weeks ago. This time we're going to jump right into the next one. We're doing The Empire Strikes Back. I'm not going to review the plot, of course. This is a movie that everyone is familiar with. We're just going to jump right into the science. We start off on the ice planet of Hoth. Are ice planets a thing that could exist? Absolutely. In fact, we have had an ice planet in our solar system. It was called the Earth. Over the Earth's history, its climate has changed quite a bit, and it has gone through at least four of what we call ice ages, where the planet was partially frozen with massive glaciers that advanced all the way across the major continents. In astronomy, we sometimes talk about the habitable zone, the distance from that star at which it is cold enough to have liquid water, but not so cold that the liquid water freezes. That band can be very narrow, and the actual climactic conditions can depend dramatically on the conditions of the planet. The reason for Earth's ice ages are still a bit disputed, but they generally fall into several categories, one of which is the composition of our atmosphere. You know, just as carbon dioxide and methane warm our atmosphere now, the absence of them could cause the planetary temperature to drop. There's also these cycles where the Earth moves closer or further away from the sun, and even a small change in distance can dramatically change the amount of uh, energy that's being deposited on the Earth, and that can cause ice ages. So you could absolutely get an ice world. Now, I talk specifically specifically about ice ages in this circumstance, because I think of Hoth as a planet undergoing an ice age. The reason is because it has evolved life. When the Earth was in some of its glacial periods, especially when they were very severe, it sort of impaired the evolution of life, because ice life cannot evolve inside ice. Hoth has evolved life. It has wampas, it has tauntauns, like we see in this image here. So it must have had some period, temp some temperate period, where those life forms could evolve. It took billions of years for life to evolve on our planet, hundreds of millions of years for multicellular life to evolve, and especially to this level of sophistication. So I think of Hoth as being a planet that is in a temporary ice age. Very good place to hide because most people wouldn't want to go to a planet uh, that's having an ice age. Absolutely realistic. Ion cannons or particle cannons are a very real possibility. This is something that is research. They've been especially explored in the context of what is literally called Star Wars, the uh, weapons program we were working on in the 1980s to try to stop uh, nuclear missiles from striking the United States. A particle beam wouldn't cause that kind of disruption. That's more of an electromagnetic pulse that's hitting the star destroyer and disrupting its electronics and not destroying it. Particle beams actually would be extremely destructive. Now, that I didn't mention this in the last video, but another reason to talk about ions is the main place that we use ion beams is engine thrusters. If you're familiar with the TIE fighters in Star Wars, they're, they're called TIEs because they're twin ion engines. Their engines emit ions and that provides the thrust, you know, Newton's law. So the thrust balances, you emit ions from the back of the fighter and the fighter moves forward in response. We actually use ion engines to maneuver spacecraft uh, in real life. And maybe part of the inspiration for that was from Star Wars. I mean, it's a sound, scientific principle to use ion engines, another place where Star Wars was looking forward. Obviously, there's a lot going on here that's not scientifically possible, the you know, spaceship banking in space and turning around and things like that. But um, I did want to talk about the asteroid field. I've often used this uh, scene as sort of a joke to illustrate that our asteroid belt is not like this. 
The asteroid belt in the solar system is very sparse. There are very few rocks in it, and it doesn't look like this at all. But that's in our solar system. Could you have a dense asteroid field like this in another solar system? It seems unlikely, especially if Hoth is old enough to have evolved life. Early in our history, there was what we called the Great Bombardment. The solar system was filled with debris left over from its formation. And those asteroids pelted the planets. We can still see the scars of that bombardment on the moon and in the, some of the moons in the outer solar system. If you had a planet that had broken up, maybe you had a planetary collision where two planets smashed into each other and you have a lot of debris left over, you could have something like that. There is, of course, this very famous scene where they go into a cave and it turns out it's a monster and it tries to eat them. I can only imagine such a large creature would have evolved on a much larger planet where it had a food supply. And so this must be a breaking up, broken up planet, maybe where they tested the Death Star. I don't know. We do find very unusual solar systems out there. Vega, for example, has a disk of material around it. It's a very young star. A Tabby star, which I worked on, has this ring of dust around it. Uh, that we didn't expect. So we do have a wide variety of solar systems. So hundreds of billions of stars in this galaxy, you could potentially find one where two planets have smashed together and created a lot of asteroids. It would make it easier to cover your tracks and conceal your presence there. But as they note, it would also make it more difficult to detect incoming starships. It's kind of unrealistic compared to what we know about asteroid fields. And such an asteroid field would be extremely rare, so rare that C-3PO would not be able to calculate the odds. But I'm not going to say it's completely out of the question. For my ally is the Force, and the powerful ally it is. Life creates it, makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us, combines us. Luminous beings shall be not this crude matter. You must feel the Force around you. you. I mentioned in my last video that Star Wars is more of a fantasy film than a science fiction film. And so the Force is basically magic in the Star Wars universe. And like all magic, new spells are invented, new powers are discovered all the time. It's not bound by physical laws. Psychic powers are a staple of science fiction. So I did want to talk about are psychic abilities, telekinesis, uh, precognition, that sort of thing possible. There is no evidence of psychic abilities in human beings. Every test we have ever done has failed to detect them. Every challenge that has been issued, every prize that has been offered for proof of psychic abilities has gone unclaimed. But that doesn't mean such powers couldn't exist. There are a lot more senses than we think. You, you know, we talk about the, the, the five senses human beings have. We actually have more than that. We have our sense of balance. We have our sense of where our body is in space. We know that animals can have senses we don't understand. We found out recently that birds navigate by sensing polarized light. Even on planet Earth, the variety of senses and abilities just in Earth-bound creatures is pretty profound. And so I don't think I would absolutely close off the possibility of psychic abilities. Now, there are limitations. In the Star Wars universe, the force is able to communicate faster than light. That's probably not possible. Things have to communicate faster than light. Even if you're talking about after hyperspace, things have to move in space and time in order to be uh, perceived. But you also, if you're talking about telekinesis, if you're lifting an X-wing and moving it to the shore, the energy needed to pick up the X-wing and move it has not changed just because you're waving your hand at it and using psychic abilities. The energy has to come from somewhere. And this is one of the things I do kind of like about the way Star Wars approaches this, that Luke isn't generating the energy inside his body. He is more channeling it. That the idea is that the Force is everywhere and Force-sensitive people have the ability to use that energy, use that power, use that interconnectedness in order to dodge laser blasts or pick up spaceships and so forth. So the energy comes from all around us. Could there be a mystical untapped energy all around us? Maybe. There are theories about things like vacuum energy, that the universe is in a high energy state and that could be potentially tapped and be a basically an unlimited source of energy. In the first movie, Ben Kenobi uses the phrase that the force is something that surrounds us and penetrates us and binds the galaxy together. I like those words. I use those words when I am describing something in science class. That something is dark matter. For the last century almost, we have known that there is a lot of matter out there that is invisible to us. 
we can see from the motions of stars, the motions of galaxies, the rotation of galaxies, that they have to have some invisible matter holding them together. And we look at how much stars and gas and stuff that emits light is there. There's not nearly enough. Galaxies should be flying apart. Star clusters should be flying apart. Galaxy clusters should be flying apart. The only way they are able to hold together is if there's this mass of invisible matter, way more than there is the ordinary matter. It's what we call non-baryonic. Baryonic matter just means ordinary matter, the stuff you and I are made out of. We know it's not black holes or anything like that because it would interact with other matter and emit light and we would see it. Now, one of the most popular candidates for this is some kind of subatomic particle. There are subatomic particles out there called neutrinos, which are very copious. By the time I finish this sentence, trillions will have passed through your body. But they rarely interact with matter or themselves. Those trillions that pass through your body, you won't even notice them. They're not going to damage your body at all. They just pass through us. So the thought right now is that dark matter might be subsomatomic particle like that, only interacting even less than neutrinos do. Let's say that, that dark matter is subatomic particles. It surrounds us, it literally penetrates us, and it literally binds the galaxy together. This has struck the imaginations of some writers. If you've read The Golden Compass, and if you haven't, spoiler warning, the idea there is that dark matter is the source of consciousness and intelligence and so forth in the universe. The idea that there might be this invisible energy field that we are unaware of, mostly, but that if you were aware of it, you could do other things. Yeah, it's a leap. It's fantasy. But on the other hand, 95% of the universe is stuff we don't understand. Dark matter and dark energy. We have no idea what those things are. We have theories but we have no proof. We've never captured it in a lab. 95% of the universe is unknown to us. And I think until it is known, the idea that there might be something else out there, that there might be some interconnectedness, we don't understand human consciousness at all. We don't understand why I experience the universe through my body, why you experience the universe through your body. There's so much we don't understand out there that I think there's enough room that you can play with to, sure, have some psychic abilities. I think you need to address it in a realistic way, where the energy is coming from, what the limitations are, if you want it to be science fiction rather than fantasy. And Star Wars sort of edges around that, I think, quite nicely. It is something fantastic that is invented for these movies and for many other science fiction uh, stories that involve psychic powers. But at the present time, it's not bang my head on the desk inaccurate. We know that humans do not have psychic powers but we don't understand enough of the universe to say psychic powers could not exist. So Cloud City, could you have a city in the clouds? Not on Earth, but you could have them somewhere else. You could have them on Venus. Venus is one of the most extraordinary planets in the solar system. Despite being the second one out from the sun, it is actually has the hottest surface. The reason is because green, Venus has a runaway greenhouse effect. It has these thick clouds which trap heat and burn carbon dioxide out of the surface which in intensifies the clouds, which intensifies the heat. And so on the surface of Venus, it's hot enough to melt lead. But if you got up into that cloud layer, you would get to points where the temperature and air density are not that far from Earth. Now, you wouldn't be able to walk around without a spacesuit. It would still be this choking atmosphere of carbon dioxide and sulfur and other things. But if you, you could actually just be there with a face mask and so forth and survive. And there are science fiction stories that have speculated on the idea of cloud cities in the clouds orbiting around Venus. A uh, very fantastic, really uh, designed from Lucas's imagination, but not something that's that far out of the realm of possibility. Now, I did want to talk very briefly about the carbon freezing scene. I've addressed this concept of hibernation, of cryogenic hibernation, in a previous video on 2001. Basically, it's a reasonable idea, but technically we have not been able to achieve it yet. One of the things I do like about here is the implied risk. Boba Fett and Vader talk about how there's a risk here that Han will be killed in this process. That's actually very realistic. 
if you were to freeze someone, especially if you were to freeze them very quickly, we're made mostly of water. What happens to water when you freeze it? It expands, right? So if you formed a whole bunch of ice crystals in your body when you froze, it would shatter your internal everything internally. All your blood vessels would rupture, all your lymph vessels would rupture, all your organs would be damaged. It would be a very quick but very horrible death. So nice little touch that they make this a crude way of doing this that they usually only use to freeze cargo and that they've never actually tried it on a human being and that therefore there's a very real risk that Han could die. There is. That is a lovely spiral galaxy. It's spinning a little bit faster than spiral galaxies spin. It takes them about 250 million years to rotate, so you wouldn't be able to see that. So overall, I mean, obviously this movie is a classic. It is regarded as the best of the original trilogy, and most people, I think, would still regard it as the best of the entire series. It is where the series obtains its depth. It is where it gets its darkness. It is where the stakes are raised and raised. It sets up the, the climax of Return of the Jedi. And of course, it's just a fantastic movie in its uh, in its own right. The action is very you know, up in front and then it lets the plot develop and the characters develop and finally ends with one of the best lightsaber duels the series has ever seen and so forth. And of course, ends on this, this wonderfully somber note. It's a classic. As science fiction, I think it, it actually holds up okay. It has the usual science fiction tropes, faster than light travel, spaceships making U-turns, people dodging laser blasts, that's all there. But it excels in imagining exotic planets that are not that far out of the realm of possibility. Planets that could be in our solar system if circumstances had been a little different. It grounds some of its abilities in sort of realistic things, those ion engines, the ion cannon, you know, having the force being where you have to tap into an energy field, not generate it from your own little puny human body. These kind of little scientific touches, it's not going to make it make anyone's list of the most accurate scientific movies ever, actually, but it enhances the movie. It's one of the places the movie draws its strength, that it takes reasonable scientific ideas and builds on them with imagination. And we see, once again, a massive universe, a massive galaxy, many creatures, many planets, huge variety, a universe that is uh, as big as the story they are trying to tell. So that was a quick jaunt into one of my favorite food movies of all time. We'll be back in a few weeks, uh, maybe with something else, maybe with a movie, uh, whatever. Uh, leave a, Be sure to leave a comment if you have an idea of what I'd like to do. Be sure to mash that subscribe button and give me upvotes and tell all your friends about how wonderful this channel is if you think it's wonderful. But beyond that, uh, I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Thank you for watching. The force, of course, the force, of course, of course, of course.